Hello there, I'm Steve Balch, director of the Texas Tech Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. And this is another of our Institute Encounters, in which we have a conversation with one of the uh, many distinguished speakers who we bring to Texas Tech. And today it's my great pleasure to uh, bring a speaker all the way from my old hometown of New York, Mark Hitchley, who is Provost of the King's College, a um, very exciting young institution uh, located um, right down in the uh, financial district of Wall Street. In addition to being Provost, which as you can imagine takes up a good deal of his time, he's also a musicologist, a music historian, um, and has written a set of books uh, toward a global music history and toward a global music theory. And one of the things that we like to do here at Texas Tech is ask big questions. Um, and big questions in any subject uh, that pertains to Western civilization, which is just about anything, uh, comes close in any event. And today we're going to talk about our, uh, the origins of Western music, and particularly the origins of, of Christian music, of, of Western religious music, which surprised me. Uh, we can actually trace all the way back to kind of nearly uh, the beginnings of, of Christianity, back to perhaps the first century. So uh, let me let me start off by asking you: I mean, how do we know what Christian music was like uh, all the way back then? Well, Dr. Balch, first of all, let me just thank you for the opportunity to be here at Texas Tech and at the wonderful institute. Uh, what a privilege it is. And thanks for the chance to have this conversation. Oh, I'm pleasure. really excited about uh, thinking about music history from a global perspective. And so I know we're going to talk today about uh, the rise of Christian music. Um, to your question first, because it goes to the entire sort of musicological concern here. And it's been, um, I hate to use a catch word right away, but it's been kind of a bugaboo of ancient musicology because, of course, we don't have any audio recordings. We have no, you know, we have, what we have, though, are literary depictions or descriptions. We have visual depictions. We ha And then in many cases, we have <clears throat> living tradition, um, which, again, might have been influenced along the way, of course, but, but, is, um, but is very likely to retain some of the key elements. And so... <clears throat> We're fortunate enough to have two very important living traditions from the very beginning of Christian music. Um, and uh, before I talk a little bit about those, I just want to say uh, Christian music was not Western music. It, it, it certainly could not have been because uh, at the very, very earliest, you know, musicologists think of Western music as arising somewhere um, around maybe the eighth or you know eighth or ninth century. And really, I think that's too early. <laughs> it really doesn't rise until, in my, in my opinion, until about 1200, sometimes between 1200. They don't think and the Greco-Roman music should be thought of. Correct. And, and there's a reason for that. And, yeah. I, and I, I, I will have to sort of go into some <clears throat> extended detail on this because, because Christi Christianity and Christian music arose in what we would call the Afro-Eurasian old world. And that world was a very complex one musically. Um, I mean, if you if you just think, and forgive me, I'm, I brought a copy of the book, <laughs> uh, and I'm and I'm using it for reference to make sure that I get my dates and, and uh, references correctly. But but um, <clears throat> this this old you know this Afro Eurasian old world uh, had inputs over many many thousands of years that were highly intercultural, and I mean we, in, in my book I go all the way back to 3500 BCE. With, with with the Mesopotamians because and Sumerians because they that's we have some of the earliest written descriptions of music theory and we also have some remnants of instruments that demonstrate the, the way they thought about tuning and acoustics <clears throat> and then if you want to we, we would in this particular question we'd need to put Israel and Israeli music Hebrew music which, if you use the traditional dating, goes back to, say, about 2100 BCE, or somewhere between that and 1000 with the rise of King David. You mean the sort of Jewish liturgical music? Yes. If you like. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then if it, we'd also have to include the Greek and, and Byzantine music, 
which comes from you know sometime in the 600 to 400 BCE, we'd have to include Persian music because, um, which the you know the the the, um, the, the Persians that, that are relevant to this question would have been maybe two 200 to 600 common era, um, and then finally we'd have to include what the Arabs brought from Central Asia and Persia which, by the way, had connections to India, <laughs> to North Africa. We even have to go back to the Phoenicians, because the Phoenicians were in those parts of coastal Asia Minor, and they populated, as we know, North Africa. So there's an incredible... And, and if you look at all of the musical theory and description, instruments, um, uh, visual depiction, you see that the ancient world was highly intercultural in terms of how they used all of the theory around that. So, forgive me for <laughs> waxing on about that, but that's the context in which early Christian music arose. <clears throat> and um, Western music didn't really pull away into something more distinctive until many, many, many hundreds of years later. So, well, we have a situation then in which the, the two earliest traditions that we have you know, of living practice today are the Syrian Orthodox Church, because those, that was Roman, now Syrian territory in which Christianity rose, and they actually do things in Biblical Aramaic and, and all the rest. We also have, though, the uh, Ethiopian Orthodox Church, which had apparently had connections to the Syrian Church, and there are recordings, although I don't have them with me today, of Ethiopians singing actual Syrian early Christian music. Um, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church was a bit later, rose somewhere between 400 and 600 common era. So I actually have been able though to pull out a couple of examples of this. If um, this is this is now um, living practice of Syrian Orthodox Christians singing a communion chant, uh, and I think we'll be able to hear that. So let's see, okay, forgive me for sticking my foot up to the camera. So if you're familiar with um, Jewish cantillation or, Islam, or Quranic cantillation, you will hear that that is very similar. Yes, indeed. And so the scholarly record and, and shows that Christian music took from mm -hmm. West Asian music. That's where it started. It actually started from um, Jewish cantillation. Now, there's not absolute agreement on this, I will have to say. Um, there's a scholar, David Hiley, who insists that it, it very quickly pulled away from that. But certainly in the earliest centuries, you have, and I'll just read a little bit here, um, you have the, the idea of, of uh, syllabic chanting with some melismas. This was how the Hebrew chanting was done. A melisma is a... Uh, the melisma is we have several notes on one syllable. I see. So that most of it was actually one syllable at a time, monosyllabic, because that's where that's where you can understand it. But then the ornamentation comes around some melismatic, non-syllabic uh, speech rhythms. Um, and, uh, and and if I may just quickly get into a little bit of the music theory behind this, these 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 Hebrew chants tend to use diatonic subsets, and these are like the major scale, minor scale, the white notes on the piano, um, and recurring melodic motifs. And this is part of what, what we could call the sort of old world modality uh, of the Afro-Eurasian world, and that is uh, a collection of pitches, which is a, not a set of scales exactly. It's, it's a, there, are, there are melodic motifs that you draw from that that emphasize the nature of the mm -hmm. mode, mm -hmm. and then you combine that with whatever language you're dealing with. So. Um, we can go back, and, and I know I'm, I'm going on here, but I'll just say one more thing, and then maybe we can listen to another piece of music. Okay. Um, you know, we, you have uh, the geographical proximity. I, I, did I include Egypt before? Yeah, Egypt clearly influences this. And there's a really interesting um, uh, parallel 
between the Jewish use of the shofar, uh, the uh, Buddhist use of a conch, conch shell, <laughs> and the use of the kudu ram's horn in Africa, all part of religious sort of trumpet signaling. Oh, I see. Uh, and so this this was the milieu in which Christian mm -hmm. music arose. Um, also, um, the Levite tribes, who were the most exp uh, expert in music mm -hmm. in the Old Testament, priestly, tribe, right? Yeah. Exactly. So they were they were among the prize musicians mm -hmm. along this Indus mm -hmm. Nile corridor, if we could call it that, um, and spent considerable um, time as professional musicians, both within and outside their own culture. So this is what was going on. Um, here's a little bit of the uh, Ethiopian music, which is not dissimilar. And this music, though, requires what I would say is a little bit more patience because there are several features to it, one of which can be traced across Central Asia, actually, but they use this stick that they pound on the ground to keep sort of the uh -huh. time. And they also use sistrums, which clearly come from Egyptian origin. A sistrum are making, is a they're, they're rattle? These, yeah, it's a, it's a metallic rattle. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Uh, and then the the chanting itself, the pitches are going to be more like what you know what you heard, but uh, in a in a somewhat more deliberate way. You know. Hopefully, there won't be an ad. Okay. So it starts with the chanting. It sounds really similar, but then pretty soon they'll get into this rhythm and sing together. Looks like it's outdoors. Yep. Now, you can't see it on the video, but they have these big poles, mm -hmm. and they will uh, come together in a line, and they will start stamping the poles, and then you'll hear the... You hear the little shakes of the cistern. Mm -hmm. So it's not an organized choir. They're actually inviting the people there. No, these are all professional are musicians, they? Okay. and they would. They, this is a Christmas celebration. Mm -hmm. Now you can hear them starting to sing together, and then Processing? They're, they're sort of moving back and forth, banging their sticks, shaking their rattles, and now they've come together into the sort of known music, which, by the way, was created by uh, a, a saint from the church named Yarin from in about 400 BC. So I, we heard the trumpet the whole Yeah. The clapping's in there, too. Uh, and this goes on for, these pieces go on and on and on for a very long time. It requires a lot of patience to listen to them. So these are actual living traditions, right, from some of the earliest centuries of Christian music. Um, another thing that was really important to those early church fathers, many of whom were North African, don't forget. I can, we can talk about some of the names here in a minute. But um, was that they were very concerned about being different from the, um, from the Hellenistic music that pervaded Greco-Roman culture at the time because it was associated with licentiousness. Mm -hmm. And so they were anxious to do something different. And as a result, this is what's so, I think, fascinating and maybe ironic about it, <laughs> is that early Christian music is less Hellenistic and more Asian mm -hmm. because they were trying to get away from the Hellenism that had sort of spread out you know, through Alexander and his legacy across that part of the world. So. We can talk about some of those names if you want, but I've talked a lot, so do you want to continue to... <laughs> uh, well, um, after Rome Christianizes, yeah. 
Uh, does that bring about change in the music? Are they then sort of more open to Hellenistic modes at that point? Right. So you have the what I think is pretty well known antagonism between Roman culture and Christian culture. And I know they had Christianized, but there were very, very much like it is perhaps in, in a city like New York City today, there were Christians who tried to be to remain part of the culture and tried to be more open minded about, you know, cultural practice, particularly in things like music. Um, and then there were some that just completely uh, drew away and of course it wasn't very long before the monastic tradition started as a result of that desire to get away from you know poor cultural influence. So as it develops is there a uh, if that would suggest that monastic music might be distinct from the music of the mass say in a, in a church or cathedral the monastic music sort of holding on to its kind of Middle East and North African origin, trying to retain that purity. Yeah. But the, move, the music performed in, in the churches where, where the laity kind of came to worship, more, more like the, the ambient music in, in, in Roman and, and Greek culture. Is that could Could true? be. Um, it's, that is not as clear, I don't mm -hmm. think, from the record. Um, all, I, all we know, though, from the writings of these fathers, and, and these, are, these are names that, that folks may know very well, like Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian of Carthage, uh, and certainly Augustine himself, St. John Chrysostom. Um, here's a quote from St. John Chrysostom that was um, made by August Augustine in, his, in one of his own works, Christian Doctrine, uh, where he basically um, the dis where he makes it, it's not a quote, but he makes a distinction between uh, musica luxuriantis, <laughs> you know, in other words, the sort of sensuous music, and luxuriosa aureum voluptua, so that, or, that creates this sensuous feeling in the listener, and then uh, musica sapientis, which is the sort of music of the mind and the spirit, and this became an, inc an important distinction. So I, I don't expect that um, the influence, the, the, the record doesn't show that there was Hellenistic influence even in the cathedrals, if that's what you're asking. Um, I think they, as we see from the living tradition, I think they maintained as much of the separation from that as possible. And of course, there was no Islam at the time, so there wasn't a concern mm -hmm. at that time about uh, mimicking Islamic music, and there wouldn't have been as much concern about mimicking Jewish music because that was the tradition out of which it arose. You know? So, yeah, it was quite, it was quite a time. And uh, um, it wasn't, of course, the, the, the music of the cathedrals and the cathedral schools that I think maybe you're talking about, that, that doesn't come until much, much later, I think. No, well, actually, I, would, I was thinking of, uh, had you gone, for example, to the, to the cathedral in Milan or right. uh, someplace like that, mm -hmm and attended a service, right. what would the singing have been like? And you're sort of suggesting it probably would have been that sort of original Christian Middle Eastern type. I think so, mode. for a long time. Mm -hmm. the, the first real evidence we have of an attempt to do something more uniquely sort of European really doesn't come until maybe 700, 800, mm -hmm. 900. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a really interesting parallel about what's going on in Spain because that's right at the time when the Arabs come, too. <laughs> what's going on in Spain and what's going on up north in, in the um, Carolingian kingdoms. And there's all of this intercultural stuff still going on. They're all in, in, uh, um, they're all in political conversation with the Arab world. Uh, the Arab world has taken over much of North Africa. It's moved into Spain. And so maybe that was the impetus, right, to try to start to pull away and do something different. Um, but uh, Charlemagne, you know, we use this term Gregorian chant, which mm -hmm. is where many music history textbooks mm -hmm. say this is the beginning of Western music. Um, I still don't think that's right, because it doesn't, it's still, even though it's different, the chant, at that, it becomes, starts to become different at that point. It's still part of the sort of old world tradition of monophonic singing, you know, the single melody. That clearly is just uh, you know, in, in concert with 
the way religious music had been done <laughs> for many, many centuries in other religions, too. Um, it's really, you don't really get to Western music, which we'll talk about in the, mm -hmm. tonight, um, until you get to two really distinctive characteristics, one of which is harmony as a focus, mm -hmm. and the other of which is counterpoint, which is independent melodic lines, particularly when they're controlled by the harmony. So, um, Christian music wasn't Western for a very long time. So, Pope Gregory, yeah. who is Pope, if I recall, at the end of the 6th and beginning of the 7th century, uh, he's, he's Gregory the Great, and he's credited, he was a monk himself before he becomes Pope, uh, and he was credited traditionally uh, with kind of creating the, uh, the original uh, Gregorian chant. Right. Um, do we know anything about his? That's, that's partly myth, I take it. His role was essentially in organizing chants mm -hmm. across many sort of disparate practices. Mm -hmm. And uh, no notation was just barely beginning, you know, music notation of a very rudimentary kind was just barely beginning to, to emerge. Really isn't until Charlemagne mm -hmm. and his British associate Alcuin mm -hmm. uh, who really take the chant that the Gregorian folks have sort of started to codify and really try to make it something different. In so, so what is, we'll get back to the Gregory himself, yeah. what is what is he doing? Well, he's, it's basically administrative. Yeah. He, he's, he's looking... Not composing anything. Oh, no, 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 no. The no. foundational composer no. of the West. <laughs> no, no, he's, he's just, he, he, he sees that Christian practice is too disparate and he's concerned about the, you know, growing church not having a consistent worship practice so it's really it's really a vision for consolidation and clarification yeah. but it's picked up on you know a, a couple hundred years later or so there's a he creates a kind of volume of standard literature yep and then that kind of diffuses throughout the western part of Christendom um, and then in the court of Charlemagne, is it, it in Charlemagne's court himself, right? Yeah, I mean, there's, it's likely that it was going on a little before that, but Charlemagne is the one we know is really intent on this. Yeah. So Charlemagne is, is interested in kind of recreating the Roman Empire. He can bring it off. And um, what does he do? What is he and is it Alcuin? Is that, yeah. Uh, well, I think they also look at the situation and they pick up on this vision that Gregory has put forward and said that we need to do something that is distinctively Christian. We need to do something that is more consistent. We need to do something that is learned. That was, of course, one of his big things was that he... So what does that mean in his context? Learned? Well, it, it means that, you, that you, it's not willy-nilly, right? You're going to try to come up with better notation. Mm -hmm. You're going to try to come up with a better standard practice. I need just to insert something there, mm -hmm. though. Again, it's easy to forget, though, that music was still very much an oral tradition, and which is a very non-Western perspective, of course. Does notation exist outside the West? It does, but it's very different. And in, in it, in just like in the early West, music notation outside the West and cultures. So for example, there's some Japanese music. I, I play the shakuhachi, mm -hmm. Japanese shakuhachi music has a kind of notation, but all of these notations are simply shorthand reminders to the performer of what the music, you know, so the, 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 the skeleton of the music, all of the nuance, all of the ornamentation, even some of the decisions about some of the rhythms and, you know, all of that, that is done through oral tradition, and it was still very so much the case. it's not necessarily improvised, but it's learned orally, and right. by listening to other people perform. Yes, um, I, I guess I just want to. I just. I just want to clarify based on what you said. There is probably. There is still improvisation. It's just within a certain constraints. But if you want to listen to a, a, a classic of Japanese music, right? Um, you could tell that it's that piece. You could tell it's that piece right. by looking at the notation, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't tell you everything you need to do in order to play it. Exactly. And so was and exactly the same situation attended to early Christian chant and early Christian notation, which is I think part of part of what the impetus was on the part of Charlemagne was to try to actually excise out <laughs> the sort of oriental they would call it, you know, Asian elements, uh, and make something more distinctively Western. Which is I think why 
Western scholars have sort of tended to see that that chant as as kind of the first attempt at something distinctively Western. The problem is, it in practice it wasn't. It was it was only still proto Western. So Charlemagne wants to create as part of his project is to create a distinctive Western mm -hmm. musical form, and presumably he wants to do this to. Um, Distinguish himself from from surrounding uh, somewhat uh, alien and enemy peoples, where he does this to glorify his empire or to uh, well attribute to God. What 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 are his motivations? I, I think there's every indication that you know Charlemagne was a was a devout Christian, but but it was tied up in a lot of complex political power. Also, I do think you know. Um, there was there had been the entire thing about stopping the Muslims, you know, in Poitiers Tours, right. and so I'll just let me just read a little bit about this. You know, Charlemagne supported the development of the arts and and learning in the form of the classical tri trivium and quadrivium. So he was pulling in from Greek sources. Uh, from his cap uh, capitulary of 789, says this: every monastery, every abbey must have its school in which boys may be taught. Uh, the Psalms, the system of musical notation, singing, arithmetic, and grammar. And so he brings in an, an expert, you know, a, a this is professor. This before he's emperor. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, and, but at the same time, we have to remember that even Charlemagne didn't resist intercultural uh, contact. He inherited the spirit of his royal ancestor, particularly Pepin III, who famously received an organ from Constantinople. And an or the organ was a very controversial instrument because it was was tied to the Greek um, alos, um, the sort of pan pipes, and uh -huh. that was kind of the origin of it, and they made it bigger and bigger. And so it still had these uh, Hellenistic pagan, pagan yeah. right, associations, exactly right. Um, but he, you know, th this didn't seem to be a problem, and there was contemporary exchange between Charlemagne's court and Harun al-Rashid. Um, uh, the Carolingian, Carolingian court actually, uh, after Charles Martel, Held back the Muslims from, you know, gaining more access to France. Um, there was there was an alliance really with the Abbasid court in Baghdad. Well, that's because in Spain the Muslims were Omeyyad. Uh, exactly. You know, heretics. Right. <laughs> right. But the point is, so so this isn't about the political mm -hmm. religious lines. It's actually about the, the cultural lines. When you have that kind of back and forth between cultures, you're going to have mm -hmm. musical influence. Mm -hmm. And if they don't see that as being threatening to the foundations, mm -hmm. but there's but again, I don't mean to be too double-minded about this. But there's also clearly a sense in which Charlemagne felt like he wanted to do something distinctive. So, do we have any of the music of Charlemagne's time? <sighs> not really. It it was it was not in in uh, it was not in um, uh, sync <laughs> with what was going on in Rome. It was not really in sync with what was going on in Byzantium. So. We wouldn't really know. We have notation, mm. okay, and people can. I, I can't pull that up right now, but folks would try to interpret that notation just like they try to interpret any other notation. There is quite a bit of. I mean, we can go into some detail about this if you want. But there's quite a bit of evidence, though, that even though it was notated, and even though the the um, intent was to simplify and clarify, uh, the practice was still. Very divergent. Well, how can we be sure that this represents uh, a foundational moment if we don't have music? Maybe it was just a brief episode. Yeah. yeah. Well, we do. We have we uh -huh. have we have notation, but it's very. I hate to use this word, but it's very sketchy. Mm -hmm. They're absolutely clear what they mean, whether they're ornaments. Um, there wasn't a kind of clarity about which pitch was on which part of the staff. Um, you know, it isn't until really, like I say, it really isn't until somewhere between a thousand and twelve hundred notation gets to the level of specificity that you can really start to tell. So there's no CD of Charlemagne? No, there's no there. CD of <laughs> Well, I'm sure there is, but I don't, I don't have it with me. <laughs> and uh, what was Alcuin? For, so, uh, tell yeah. us a little bit about Alcuin and uh, what his role was. Well, I don't, I'm not an expert in Alcuin, but I, I just think it was, it was, he was a, he was a known scholar of Latin learning, and he had a you probably know more about this than I do. He had a good background in it from his English context, uh, so it was like bringing in the kind of high-minded expert from Northumbria, right? 
kind of learning center. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so he was he was a serious, you know, scholarly person, and of course Charlemagne was not. Uh, didn't didn't read, uh, but had a great desire to elevate, as you can see from that quote, uh, the learning in, in the kingdom and, and for himself. So, he was a he was a good politician, and that he understood that it was necessary to bring in the scholar. He needed culture as well. Culture, as the sword, exactly. <laughs> And then, you know, and then it's it's more murky, frankly, because the complexities of what happened with Byzantium, with North Africa, with the Arabs, how much of, how, how the fight went in the Iberian Peninsula, uh, and what little pockets at the very north of the Iberian Peninsula that sort of maintained Christian identity, like Galicia, or right. King of Leon, and what was going on in the cathedrals there. Um, but there's just an incredible amount of evidence of intercultural exchange that there are. For example, there's a whole class of people, Mozarabs, that are Christians who take on Islamic cultural characteristics. So, and, and, and they'll be kind of visiting the, uh, the Frankish court. Exactly. Yeah, not to mention northern Spain, where there there's a whole set of records uh, in the Santiago de Compostela, where there's people just going back. Does that survive in Spanish music? In Spanish oh, yes. music per se. Yeah. Now Spanish music is where you get the best example of the sort of intercultural exchange. Um, and uh, there's even evidence, if you want to go ahead and, and, and um, push forward to say 1200 mm -hmm. and the rise of the Notre Dame School mm -hmm. in Paris, mm -hmm. which is where we get the thing called organum, which is again kind of one of the, the sort of most Western, proto-Western <laughs> kinds of music because of Counterpoint starts to emerge, and the idea of, of modality, or restricted modality, and, and, and no uh, microtonality, and a kind of a set of rhythmic theories around which it's written. Even there, there's conversation about what was going on in Spain, in the cathedrals, mm -hmm. there, with uh, Christian cathedrals, um, that they were doing some of the same things, which is what gives rise to this notion that. Which again, we'll talk about. We can talk about today. We can talk about tonight. But but that Arab musical theory, because they've been at it for a long time and had taken a lot of Greek ideas and mm -hmm. brought them back, um, that they had to have had an influence on the direction. After the reconquest that is complete, yeah, is there an effort to kind of uh, make Spanish music more dist distinctly Western and Christian? No. This is one of the great moments of music history, and one of the reasons I really wanted to write this book. Because what happens is the ethics, so that the, the entire intercultural history of music has shifted from the cradle of civilization, Central Asia, through the Arabs, and into you know Proto Europe. And just at the time when that all gets worked out, as you just said, is the time when the Spanish are exporting their culture to the New World, mm -hmm. and so all the all the energy then shifts to the new world, and the new world is the ultimate inter-slash-transcultural. So that the high cultural music of the new world is now only really becoming discovered in North America, I see. So that I, you, yeah. you hear it more and more, certainly on classical stations. Right. Uh, important composers, you know, from the uh, 16th and 17th century in, in Mexico, exactly. in, in Peru, and places of that sort. And, uh, their music is very composite. You're saying it's exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. Even even the Are even they picking up Indian motifs as well. Yeah, even even the those that attempt to stay more sort of European, mm -hmm. you can hear the influence of indigenous music, mm -hmm. and you can hear heavily influenced from African music because what happened in 1500, you know, over several centuries in in Mexico and Point South was was a true um, integration. Of at least three different cultural musics, and what we call Latin American music today was a, was a, a completely new synthesis. What happened in North America? And now we're getting kind of far away from our <laughs> video topic here. What happened in North America was very different because the native, the, the indigenous population, had no influence, and so North, you know, music in the United States with European and African elements turned out very differently from music in mm -hmm. Central and South America, where uh, indigenous elements were quite. Right. It was at the end of the uh, 19th century, 
a group of American composers who called themselves Indianists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And who tried to weave yep. some of those, uh, it sounds a little stereotypical when you listen to it, but tried to weave some of those North American uh, yep. Aboriginal uh, well, motifs into their Dvorak music. came over yes, and true. was was appointed the head of the, the conservatory in New York and worked in the New York Philharmonic. And he just said, the, the future of American music is, is Negro, African. You know, influence, and he, of course, tried to work in and Native American. He was wrong about Native American. He was right about African American. I, I, I heard a story. It was told by Winton Marcellus when, yes. when he came here uh, to do a concert, and he said someone asked Dvorak, "What do you think of American?" He says, "Is there an American music?" Right. And he says, "Yes, there is, but you won't like where it's coming from." That's <laughs> right. That's right. He was he was uh, he was uh, really courageous about that, and it kind of worked out. It really did. When Marcellus is the last picture on my last slide tonight, so oh, I'll yeah. save that for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so really, all of what we think about as sort of high Western European music, that all came after the in, the energy shifted to the new world, which is why which is why it's controversial to think about music history from. Global but there are people. Baroque composers uh, sure. in the new world. Yeah, there are. And, uh, do, are there any composers in the classical tradition, you know, the Haydn, Mozart, uh, in, uh, who are based in the Americas? Sure, and I couldn't name you the names. They're not they're not that prominent. But are, are they not prominent because no one has really paid attention to them? Uh, are there undiscovered geniuses? I think they're uh, paying more attention <laughs> to them now. Yeah. Um, but were they, were they value, have they been continuously valued by the Latin American uh, cultures? Themselves? I don't think so. No. I think the synthesis of American music was what where all the energy has been, the guitar is a perfect sort of locus of this because it comes from very ancient uh, origins. It kind of becomes codified in, in the Iberian Peninsula and gets shipped over to the New World. And so um, as you get into the 19th and 20th century, you have serious art music composers in Latin America who, but they embrace not the old traditions, but the synthetic traditions. Right. Stara and uh, mm -hmm. the yeah. mm -hmm. right. So, what uh, are 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 the uh, ancient musical roots? I and mean, here we're talking about the Middle Eastern, really ancient musical roots of church music. Mm -hmm. um, still present, or are they being rediscovered and revived? Well, the the most prevalent way in which they're being preserved is in the Byzantine. They would have remained continuously. Pretty much, yeah. Um, they say they came to grips with this cultural synthesis of, you know, even though, you know, Christians lost <laughs> Byzantium, Constantinople to the Muslims quite a long time ago, and uh, but they're but there's still the chant tradition there that retains. I mean, Russian music, I would guess. So. Russian music, some, but Russia seems to me to have always been trying to pull more toward the Western European side and away from it. But a, but a composer like Stravinsky is a very good example. I'm thinking of Russian church music. Well, I understand. Mm -hmm. but, but, but you have to look at the whole, I think you have to look at the whole picture there because some things happen, some things can't happen in the very conservative traditions of church music that can't happen in the art music world. And so Stravinsky deliberately was trying to pull in ancient Central Asian mm -hmm. ideas back into the music. Um, Russian Orthodox music really, really got uh, refined into something very, very, very specific. Um, however, you still find some musicians, musical leaders, some scholars who think that that should be performed with some of these uh, more ancient flavors, and some just don't. So, in Puritan times in England, mm -hmm. yeah. there was a totally reject church music, but there was a kind of severe attitude toward, toward it, wasn't in terms of instrumentation, yeah. ornamentation. Yeah. Uh, is, is, is that a, obviously it's not mainstream in Christianity, but is that a that anti-music or minimalist, if that's the right way? Yeah. 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 Not the sense of today, but, uh, is, is, is that a, a, a tradition that has early roots as well? Well, I think it probably, they feel like they're go, they were going back and felt mm -hmm. 
that they were going back to this idea of trying to not be world planning, right? That the idea was to be very so the rejection of Greco Roman is sort of echoed in the Puritan rejection I, I of think so, ornamental yeah. church music. Exactly so. Now, of course what's interesting about that is that it got all shipped to the United States and it and they could not prevent it from being heavily influenced by African Americans, most of whom became Christian. And the entire gospel tradition of the United States comes from the synthesis of those two things. So but I don't think they would well, for a while some would probably Puritans would see that as a you know, and what what they did was they tried to go back to a very sort of pure, almost chant like, you know, everybody singing in unison. And there's still some Christian traditions who do this. Um, very simple, you know, what we would call them, um, sorry, my terminology's failing me, but, you know, very simple things, not a lot of big leaps in the melody, very easy to learn. Because, of course, one of the, one of the most conservative. Instincts in church music is to sub sublimate the music to the point of the words, teaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. So the music, if you go back to Cal, you know Geneva and Calvin, I mean he he basically took all the color <laughs> out of the music because he was trying to make it so simple that it just became ditties for people to learn the psalms, the the, the, the metrical psalms. Uh, simple little melodies. Right. You don't want the music to compete with the, the gospel. Did he, did he, Luther composed and he did. the music as well as the, the words. Yes. And very well. Very well. Kind of deathless yeah, he had a very song. different view of this. Yeah. He wanted to bring music back to the people uh -huh. from the professional class uh -huh. as well, but he did it through much more pop or, you know, influence. I mean, it's of course a myth that Luther stole barroom songs and turned them him. But he did steal the style of those barroom uh -huh. songs. Uh -huh. you know, we, if, if anybody knows Ein Festeburg is Unser Gott, the way it's done, <coughs> been done from the 1700s on, it's a kind of a very you know, white bread, straightforward mm -hmm. kind of thing. But not when Luther wrote it. Uh -huh. when Luther wrote it, it was Ein Festeburg ist Unser Gott. Yeah, all this dancey rhythm and yeah. stuff that would have been, would have been considered kind of dangerous <laughs> which gets us back to this, this this it's a swinging back and forth in the, in the Christian community in the 1950s in the United States it was the same debate we can't let rock music into the church because it's about sex but that didn't happen <laughs> but now it's all about rock music so, so what is the what is the just got to conclude here what is the <laughs> what is the status of uh, church music today in the United States well or I Europe think, too I think it's I think it's been very interesting and, and I you know I want to be careful to be as neutral as I can be in what I say about it because I think there's some real benefit to having music that a, a lot of people feel that they can you know buy into mm -hmm. and, and participate in um, but but American pop style has become the, the, the reverse style of, of you know evangelical Christian music you and I were talking earlier about when you go to uh, Ethiopia today, only the the, 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 the gray heads do the old music. The, the young Ethiopian Christians do American pop music, Christian music. Right, the cab driver plays yeah. his music and yeah. it sounds like <laughs> karaoke. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, if I can just quickly pick up on that, there's a really interesting movement called ethnodoxology going on right now. And in ethnodoxology, the idea is to go, is to encourage indigenous populations to take their own musics mm -hmm. and adapt them mm -hmm. to Christian worship mm -hmm. rather than uh -huh. allowing, you know, Western pop music mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. overshadow that. And there's been some good strides in that. There's some very interesting media coming out of that. So. Where, what part of the world particularly? Oh, all over. All Asia, over Africa. Africa. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of going to listen to some of these, uh, these, these kind of interesting traditions now that you've pointed them out to me. And great but, fun. Thank you. My pleasure.